Hello and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson, the legal and government correspondent. And uh, we've had a bit of a hiatus um, in, in taping segments, but I want to welcome you back. And uh, joining me today is a special guest who is a candidate for Congress, Kelly Westland. Kelly, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, well, first of all, I guess the best way to start is tell us a little bit about your background before we get to the why you're running for Congress issue, okay? Sure, sure. Uh, well, I can tell you that I grew up in a military family. My father was Air Force, my stepdad's Navy, and my mom uh, worked for a long time for the Department of Defense. So I spent much of my youth moving around, uh, largely in the South. Actually. I would say if they are, have military backgrounds, there's not a lot of military bases in Wisconsin. So. <laughs> right. Um, South Carolina, Texas, and Utah for the most part. Okay. So um, I came to Wisconsin to go to school actually at Northland College where I got my degree in conflict resolution. So those are some skills I'm hoping to put to use in Congress. Uh, since graduating, I've done a lot of work um, focused on issues of local self-reliance, things like energy conservation, renewable energy, and then more recently I've been working with family farmers uh, to develop a strong local food system that helps family farmers bring in enough income where they can make a good living, but that you know they're also connecting local people with affordable local food, which has been great. Um, yeah, so I guess that's, and of course, I also serve on the Ashland City Council. I've been there for okay, about Okay, I was going to say, so you've uh, been in Wisconsin how long? It's uh, going on about 13 years. Okay, and you had mentioned getting a degree in conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. Again, what uh, facility was that from? That what? was at Northland College. That's how I ended up in Ashland. Okay, so you went to school to Ashland, and never you was. actually <laughs> fell in love with that climate? I know. Well, I, I never would have thought it when I first moved there. I'd never, never seen snow like that before, but... Now I've actually uh, managed to get most of my family. I have one brother who doesn't live in Ashland. Everyone else is relocated. And uh, I, I feel a little bit guilty because I told them, oh, the winters have been really mild. And then we got this one. So, <laughs> Well, let's talk about those qualifications sure. part of the background a little bit because uh, and you mentioned city council. So mm -hmm. when did you get elected to Ashland City Council? I was appointed to the city council in a vacant seat. It was a three-way runoff. Um, that would have been 2010. And then I was elected to keep the same seat uh, in, in an election where I was challenged in 2011. So this uh, year I'm not seeking re-election, obviously, because I'm running for Congress instead. Okay, very good. So you have some issues with uh, uh, local governments and how they... I suppose, work with county governments as well? Yeah, well, before that, I, when I was working at the Alliance for Sustainability on the energy projects, I coordinated, um, it was 10 local governments, different entities, counties, the cities, tribal entities, and um, our uh, Transportation Commission in, in a project that was with, it was a pilot project with the State Office of Energy Independence. So I've done a lot of work uh, pulling those different local governments together to get things done. And um, since my time on city council, I've had a great chance to see firsthand how decisions made at the state and federal level affect, you know, funding and things like of that nature at the where the rubber meets the road. Not being very familiar with Ashland's uh, local politics and with your degree in conflict resolution, have there been times where you've been able to use those skills <laughs> and and get a consensus on an issue? Yeah, as a matter of fact, um, you know, the Ashland City Council. Uh, has come a long way um, in the last few years. But when I when I came to council, I was the youngest person on council, uh, one of very few women on council, and I think that that helps to change the dynamic of the conversation, uh, just to have somebody there who you know brings a different perspective. And one of the issues that I brought to council that I'm particularly proud of is a resolution that was introduced just before um, the state passed a new mining law. I brought a resolution that picked out specific pieces of, of, of things that were in that law that we did not find um, were to the benefit of people in our community. And we put those in a resolution, and the City Council in Ashland does not agree unanimously on many things, but that was a resolution that we passed unanimously. Okay, very good. Well, sometimes we have folks that are flicking through the dial, and they join us in, uh, in mid-segment. So I want to welcome those that are here and uh, also, I think this is a good part for a disclaimer. Mm -hmm. uh, I want you to know that we have previously invited um, the person you're running against, Sean Duffy, mm -hmm. uh, to this show on multiple occasions. I've personally invited him in, in person, and I've also talked to his local staff. We have not had been able to uh, get anything scheduled yet, but we hope to in, in this election cycle. So I just want our viewers to know that we're not 
trying to favor one side or the other, but we are extending invitations and so glad that you were, your office was uh, very prompt in responding and getting something set up. So, uh, uh, Ms. Westland, it, Kelly, if I can, um, wh why are you running for Congress? I mean, one of the least liked institutions in America uh, it's probably lower now than used car salesman or even attorney, and I can say that because I am a lawyer. So, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's this has been the least productive Congress in the history of our country, and you're right. The approval ratings have been in single digits for far too long, and you know, I guess that I'm the kind of person who believes that if I want to be a part of that discussion, if we're ever going to change the way that Congress is, then then I need to pull up to the table. You know, if you want to change a system, you don't disengage from it and walk away. You lean in and you take you you take responsibility and you lead by example. And when I look at the person who's representing me in Congress right now, I don't think that he's doing a great job of of representing the best interests of the people in this district. I think that he's representing his campaign funders, and I feel as though I have a responsibility to challenge him. So that's what I'm doing. Okay, and in preparation for our interview, I went to a website, and your website is uh, www.kellywestland.com. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Um, I, I saw that there's a little bit of controversy because the Westland for Congress uh, <laughs> uh, domain, you weren't able to get that. Well, uh, I, I made the mistake of saying to the media that I was considering a run before I had purchased Westland for Congress. So, you know, uh, yes, the Republican Party, in fact, the, the GOP chair of, of my district, bought up a couple of websites with my name in it, and they've since made them into smear sites. And unfortunately, that's the state of our political system today. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not, I'm not going to let it bother me. Okay. So um, you want to make a change, and your website's also clear on the things that um, are important to you. Um, and I noticed that you are, you know, continuing to listen to folks as you're campaigning as to uh, what may be important. But very high on your list is raising the minimum wage. Is that correct? Indeed. And, uh, you know, there's uh, two sides on that issue. Actually, it could be multiple sides. but. Um, there are those folks who believe that's, I think it's what, seven and a quarter is the federal minimum mm -hmm. wage right now, that, that no one can raise a family of four on that. I think that's pretty obvious. Yeah. Uh, I think it's that, just over $15,000 a year. Which is well below what the poverty, federal poverty level is. But on the other hand, uh, there are also people, business owners, uh, who say raising the minimum wage would be a job killer and you'd be actually increasing those people on mm -hmm. unemployment. Uh, where do you stand on that issue? Well, you know, there was a, a group of about 600, over 600 economists, some of them Nobel laureates, that sent a letter to the president and to Congress that said that study after study over generations has shown that increasing the minimum wage does not, in fact, negatively affect employment. In fact, what it does is, you know, and, and Henry Ford understood this, you have to pay your employees enough to be able to, pr to purchase the products that they're making or selling. And that's how you drive new economic growth. You know, if these folks are struggling to get by working more than one job, one, they don't have a lot of leisure time, and two, they don't have a lot of discretionary income. By raising the minimum wage, we can immediately lift almost half a million people in Wisconsin out of poverty and put that spending money back into their pockets and enable them to, to, to put that back into their communities. All right. And just to play a devil's advocate here, because there are, um, you know, different segments of the population that affect different people. Very few people over the age of 40 are probably earning that minimum wage. Isn't it true that most of those people are teenagers, people in their early 20s trying to enter the job market and raising the minimum wage could be uh, disincentivizing employers to hire the entry-level workers? That's actually a, a pretty common misconception. The average age of a minimum wage employee is 35 years old. 35 years old. Over 80% of people making minimum wage are over the age of 20. These are not entry-level jobs. In fact, you know, in our workforce right now, in our economy, we have three people looking for a job for every one position that's open. You know, there, there just aren't enough jobs out there. And Congress, with their brinksmanship and fighting back and forth and shutting the government down, they're certainly not helping us to create new jobs in this economy. Uh, this is something that, you know, we, we've got a number of things that we can do, but one of the great places to start would be to raise this minimum wage so that the folks that are average 35 years old can make enough to support their families and hopefully have some discretionary income to help stimulate the economy. No, in those studies where it says that it does not adversely affect jobs, I mean, there's got to be a limit on that. I mean, mm -hmm. raising the minimum wage to 
doubling it to 14 or $15 an hour, mm -hmm. that definitely would have to have some kind of adverse effect. Sure. Is there some kind of parameter? What would you raise it to if you raised it? Well, uh, right now the proposal that's before Congress takes it, and before the state legislature as a matter of fact, takes it to 1010 over a period of time. So it's a staggered increase. $10 an hour basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, however, if it had kept rate right with inflation, it would be significantly higher. Uh, it Ideally, it would be closer to at least $15 an hour, but we understand that our economy is in, a, in recovery and that it's going to take some time to get there. However, um, 1010 per hour would be enough, as I said, to lift millions of people in this country out of poverty. And in an economy like this, we, we, that's something that we need to do, is to give them that opportunity. All right, but small businessmen uh, and women um, who are trying to operate businesses on the margin and they're paying workers, um, you know, sure. the going rate that, what may be the going rate in a community is seven mm -hmm. and a quarter or 750 mm -hmm. or even $8 an hour, which is still substantially less than 10. Um, you get enough of those jobs that are at $8 an hour, you do the math and you can only afford so many $10 an hour jobs. I mean, sure. wouldn't they need to be cutting if there was a 25% increase? That's a great point. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have been contacted by a number of small business owners who share those concerns. And there are a couple of things to think about when it comes to small businesses. First of all, um, all, again, all of these studies show that when you pay your employee a little bit more, that they're likely to stick around a little bit longer. If I'm making minimum wage at this job and that job's going to pay me a quarter more per hour, I'm gone. You know, but if you are somebody who is willing to pay them a little bit more, then you save costs in training new employees because of the lower employee turnover, for one thing. Um, the other thing that I would say is that, uh, again, you're giving those employees the opportunity to take part in the, the, economic, in the economy. Sure. Um, but with uh, some of the changes in the new health care law, for example, some of these smaller mom and pop businesses, if they've been providing any of those benefits, now no longer have to be responsible for that because their employees are making enough money where they're able to afford uh, buying health care through the exchanges. Um, well, let me, the, let, let me uh, ask one more question, then we'll move on to other sure. topics. But when it comes to the minimum wage, um, I know the federal government has had a role in raising that, but there's mm -hmm. lots of states that have already, I think it's a third of the states have already raised it on their own. Mm -hmm. Because w prevailing wages vary so much by region of the country and even within uh, regions, but state by state, sure. um, wouldn't that be an area that would be better left to uh, state uh, governments to regulate rather than the federal government dictating what wage would be because ten dollars an hour may be a good minimum wage for New York City mm -hmm. but it may be way more uh, than necessary in a rural county in Arkansas. That's fair but I think the federal minimum wage you know federal minimum wage gives bargaining power to low-wage workers that they don't otherwise have. And for the most part, the companies that are paying minimum wage are huge corporations that operate across the country, places like Walmart and McDonald's, you know, these different companies where the CEOs are making hundreds of times what the average worker is making. And so when we talk about raising the federal minimum wage, we're talking about um, affecting all of those people across the board that otherwise would be making $7.25 an hour right now. And one of the things that I think is important to take into account, uh, for example, if you're making $7.25 a week or uh, an hour, then you're making $290 a week. If you are somebody who has a child or a partner who doesn't work for whatever reason, then you know that's awfully close to the poverty line if you're able to get above it. But it does qualify you for an awful lot of public assistance. So when we are subsidizing the cost of employment for Walmart or for McDonald's, then we've got their employee, their workforces relying on public assistance. If they're required to pay more, then that means that those big, hugely profitable corporations have to stop externalizing their costs onto taxpayers. I guess um, uh, that's probably enough on the, on, the, <laughs> on the minimum wage part, but let's move on to other areas. Well, one of the issues that's been in front of Congress for several months was the extension of the unemployment benefits. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's another debate that deeply divides the two parties. Um, and one side saying that those benefits need to be extended because uh, the economy is just not cranking up as much as uh, it needs to, and, and these folks need a safety net. On the other hand, there are those folks who say that folks are dragging their feet in getting into the job market, um, and so this would spur them on to incentivize them to go out and get that $7.25 a job if we're not paying them close to that much in unemployment benefits. Sure. 
Um, well, speaking of you know the folks saying that they're dragging their feet, that was our congressman Sean Duffy who said that he felt that you know he wasn't willing to extend the unemployment insurance because he thought that folks would be dragging their feet to go back to work. Again, the fact is in this economy there are three people for every job that's available. Until Congress gets to work actually creating jobs, then those people don't have anywhere any other choice. But we can't take them off of unemployment insurance because one, it's an earned benefit, and two, that makes them completely unable to participate in the economy. It pushes them further into poverty and it just reinforces the cycle of economic downturn that we're already in. You know, um, when my, this race first made national headlines, it was because I told a very personal story. My husband is a carpenter, and uh, he worked with his dad and brother for many years building custom log homes. And uh, it's a very niche market, but when the economy tanked and the housing market crashed, they were without work. And it took a little while for them to find more work because the whole housing market was suffering. And so we did rely on those earned benefits. They've paid into them all the time they've been working. And when we took advantage of them, I know that when that check came in, that's what we used to buy groceries. That's what we used to pay bills to make sure that we were able to stay in our home with our bellies full. And I know that there are families across this country that can relate to that. Okay, well, let's stay on the subject of jobs because I think that all the surveys are very clear that uh, uh, you know, creating jobs and jobs are, and the economy are the number going to be the number one issue going into this election mm -hmm. cycle, whether it's Absolutely. federal government or state government. Now, on your website, you talk about the Affordable Care Act, but actually expansion of providing affordable health care, mm -hmm. which sounds a lot like supporting affordable uh, the, supporting the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. But um, do you see the two as necessarily interrelated? Job creation in the Affordable Care Act. Yes. Yeah, well, if you uh, heard about the, the recent report out of the Congressional Budget Office, you know, the, uh, the director testified before Congress that uh, it would actually open up more opportunities for employment because what's happening, those 2.5 million people that are leaving the workforce are doing so voluntarily because right now those are folks who are in jobs for the health care. And now they're able to strike out and be entrepreneurs or be stay-at-home parents or go back to school or any number of things because they have another option to find affordable health care. And what that means is what we said again about those one position for every three people, that opens up 2.5 million positions for other people to have an opportunity for advancement and to open up those lower wage jobs for people to enter the workforce. So people aren't getting jobs specifically for health care. They'd have it either way is what you're saying. So instead, they're being incentivized to do it to increase their income level. Or they have access to it, yeah. And, and you know, there are so many folks that say, well, I would quit this job, but I've got this really great health care plan, or I need health care at all. And um, part of what I've been talking about in terms of uh, the ACA is to expand it to include a public option. For example, where I live, I have one option when I go through the exchanges. And for folks who believe in the competitiveness of the open market, there's no competition when you have only one option. Okay, so you think that the options that are out there should be expanded? I think so. I think that um, it's going to make them more cost competitive and it's going to give me more flexibility as a consumer. Well, there's been a lot of anecdotal stories about uh, people who said, I liked my plan. I, mm -hmm. I only paid $52 a month in for health care. And now, uh, because of the mandate, I have to pay $400 a month. And that was a, an example just this morning, I think, on one of the okay. news talk shows. I haven't seen that one. I know that there is going to be a period of adjustment. You know, with anything this new and this far-reaching, there's going to be, you know, uh, there, there are going to be kinks to work out. And um, it's something that we're all still trying to figure our way through. But I think that the best bet for us at this point, because we've already expanded so much uh, op opportunity for uh, affordable care to so many people, and changes like um, you know not uh, denying access based on pre-existing uh, conditions, not charging me more for being a woman, those things are here to stay. And what Congress should do is try to identify those kinks and work them out, find fixes to improve what we have, rather than voting over and over and over again to repeal it. It's not going anywhere. Well, I don't know if I've seen any um, plans um, from this Congress to replace it with anything. They, uh, they, they, they vote to repeal it, but they don't vote to. And uh, I'm puzzled by a, a concept that was extremely popular in 2008 mm -hmm. when Barack Obama was first elected and uh, was introduced in Congress and the Republican plan was to make it mandatory so that you have more people paying into the system. Mm -hmm. It was a Republican uh, notion. Mm -hmm. Then somehow it got switched, and now it's one of the least popular pieces of legislation in the, in you know recent know. history of 
of America. How is it that something that had um, getting rid of the uh, restrictions on pre-existing conditions or expanding it so that my 26-year-old daughter or 25-year-old daughter could stay on health care mm. until her 26th birthday, those are popular notions and yet uh, people still view it as an unpopular what? Why do you think that is? You know, it's been just really effective messaging uh, to, to try to tear down the president's agenda or something that's, you know, a, a something that's been celebrated by Democrats at some point, um, in my opinion, anyway. The, you're right, though. The original proposal was written by the Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank. It was originally implemented by Mitt Romney, the Republican governor, you know, who ran for president as a Republican. And I think that because they were able to, to come together and, and find a way to pass it under a Democratic president, it was one of the only opportunities that Republicans had to keep attacking the other side. And um, Do you yeah. fault states, individual states, who want to opt out of uh, <laughs> the, some of the Health Affordable well, Care Act and, and implement their own? Well, if they're actually trying to implement their own, but when it's a state like Wisconsin where they've rejected the Medicare expansion, uh, the Medicaid expansion, and left um, so many folks without affordable access, it, it's a real, it's a serious problem. Uh, for example, where I live in Ashland, I can buy one plan here, or I can go 100 miles to the west, and the same plan is a third the cost. That's insane. Uh, that's not afford again. That's not giving people the flexibility or you know the affordability, price competitiveness that we w we're looking for. One of the uh, other pieces of uh, recent changes to Medicare, Medicaid, with, on the prescription drug plan. Mm. I think it's Part D. Um, in fact, Obama himself said, you know, why do we allow uh, the drug manufacturers to not be able to negotiate prices. Why do we have to be held hostage to their prices? And he suggested changing it, and yet Democrats had control of Congress the first two years Obama was president, and nothing was changed about that. Sure. Why do you think that was? <sighs> because of Washington, the culture of corruption. Frankly, you know, everybody has campaign funders with vested interests, and that is a perfect example of, of, one, of where uh, industry had undue influence over our government, because you know that was a part of the sausage-making process. You know, that was horse trading. That was something where pharmaceutical companies got what they wanted, and it's costing the American taxpayers well over a billion dollars over the next 10 years because Medicare can't negotiate prescription drug prices, even though the VA can, even though Walmart can. Why can't the American taxpayer? Well, and well, I would think that a party that's based on uh, the mm -hmm. economic free market and so forth would be mm -hmm. in support of that. Why hasn't that come out of Congress to say, let's open up competition and get the prices down? That campaign the contributions. Are. It's campaign contributions. That's all it comes down to. I think that we're never going to change all of the problems that are, all of the corruption in Washington unless we, we, we reform campaign finance. It's never going to happen because, you know, I went to Washington a few years ago and everybody, most people at least I would say, if they haven't been there, haven't seen it, don't watch C-SPAN, have this idea that when Congress is discussing something that they're all in the room and they're talking about these really important issues and, and they're debating each other on the finer points of the policies and, and, you know, working to find a good compromise. But when you go there, you see it's an empty room. There's a person at a podium speaking passionately to no one but themselves. And it's because everybody else is too busy doing 30 hours of fundraising calls. Well, in your, <laughs> at your website, I, I, I can understand the, the frustration. What you say is it's hard to argue because on C-SPAN we see that, mm -hmm. the, the empty chairs that they're passionately arguing to. <laughs> but um, I just want to know, do you have specific examples to kind of back up some of the things that you say that frankly aren't very nice about our Congressman Sean Duffy saying that he doesn't stand up for working families? How do you... Uh, what what's some examples that do you have to support that allegation? Well, for example, with the minimum wage, you know, there's there are organizations I've talked to constituents who have been trying to meet with him to talk about that issue for over a year and a half, and he won't meet with them. But when we call him, you know, when we take the petitions to his office, or when we call him and ask him to do this, I met with them as a candidate within the first ten days of my campaign. I don't think that you know somebody who complains that he struggles to get by on $174,000 a year, not, it just seems crazy to me that he won't take the time to at least listen to people about why it's important to raise the minimum wage. And I think that that's because he's too busy listening to party leadership and campaign funders. Okay, well, uh, do you have other issues that we haven't touched upon that you mm -hmm. think uh, 
Washington in general is out of touch on or specifically Congressman Duffy? Well, there are a number of things. Um, I guess that I would say specifically some of these issues of economic populism. You know, in this country, the money is being funneled from everyone up to the top. The most powerful people in this country are, are accumulating wealth and accumulating power, including political power. And uh, I recently contacted Congressman Duffy's office about a new bill that was introduced. It's called the Government by the People Act. And it's a step in the right direction in terms of changing how we finance campaigns. And when I told him about the bill, or his staff person, I should say, and I asked if he would be willing to be a co-sponsor. It's already co-sponsored in a bipartisan way. There are both Democrats and Republicans getting behind this bill. The response I got was a form letter that didn't even address the question I had asked. That's not how you talk to your constituents. That's not how you, I, that's not standing up for the little guy. That's not going to bat for people who are struggling to get by but losing their voice in Washington. But doesn't somebody need to stand up for the people who pay for everybody else's jobs and for the upper 1%? Do you think that they're not getting enough, uh, they're already getting too much voice then? And well, I think Congress. that they have an undue influence, absolutely. The, the folks that can afford to, you know, I, I heard it put this way. If you are a congressperson and you've been working all day and you get back to your house and you've got 10 messages on your machine and you scroll through and it's, you know, uh, Betty Lou who sent you $25 and it's uh, Joe who sent you 20, you know, it's, it's a handful of people that sent you what they could afford and then there's one person who's not in your district but they wrote you a $5,000 check. Which one's the first call you return? And when you look at the PAC uh, contributions, you know, Congressman Duffy, one of his top three campaign contributors is Coke Industries. Coke Industries has a vested interest in making sure that regulations don't affect their bottom line and their business. And he votes in favor of the things that they want him to vote in favor of. Okay. Well, yeah, you also mentioned the corporate welfare part uh, on your website. I guess we'll let people uh, review that on their own. Um, do you plan on being back in the area and focusing down here in the southwest corner of the district? I know it's a very large district and it is. one that I'm not even used to because of how drastic of a change from two years ago with the, the southern border and the mm -hmm. switch between Congress, Congressman Kine's district and now uh, uh, 7th district. So Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's shifted a little bit, but um, we have an all or part of 26 counties. And as a matter of fact, we'll have events in each of those 26 counties over the next six weeks. We've already been to 20-some uh, in the first uh, month or so of my campaign. And um, I know that between Hudson and Wausau especially are the two most populated areas of the district. So I'll be on the road quite a bit. Uh, we're largely just waiting for the weather to get a little bit better so that the travel is, is more safe. Okay. Well, if people want to know more, then they can contact you through the website, mm -hmm. I assume, if they have questions on issues that we haven't touched on here. Sure. Uh, we're also on Facebook and Twitter. So uh, I, you know, I'm the kind of person that believes that we make better decisions when we have good information from a variety of sources. Diversity makes us stronger. So I do encourage people to reach out and let me know if there are issues they're concerned about or if they have questions. All right. Very good. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having and, me. And uh, good luck in the PAN campaign. We'll see if we can get Congressman Duffy on the show. And if uh, there's an opportunity, uh, you're back in Hudson. We'll see if we have uh, time then, too. Sounds good. All right, thank you. Very good. And thank you for joining us for another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal.